Hello, everyone. Uh, Brian, I can see your smiling face on the other side, so I think uh, we're ready to go. Um, yes. Uh, unless you could, uh, you could probably presuppose that I am Hash, uh, and um, we're going to be giving you a bit of a teaser today. Um, Brian, you want to just uh, say hello? Yes, hi, I'm Brian Beveridge, and uh, I was a partner with, uh, with MNP for about nine years and a colleague of Hash's. And um, we worked together on, on multiple engagements uh, involving uh, uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies over the years, and uh, I'm still uh, working with uh, with Hash on various uh, projects and engagements uh, post retirement. Um, and I put retirement in quotes. <laughs> and um, one thing interesting is that both Brian and I did not coordinate our shirts, but somehow we managed to do that. So today uh, we're going to be cover covering four areas. We're going to tell you a little bit about who we are, uh, who is MNP. Um, and effectively, uh, this is going to be a teaser, and it's a teaser of a paper we'll be releasing. And in this presentation, we're going to be covering what we did, what we found, and what you can expect next. So, uh, Brian, over to you, a little bit about MNP. Yeah, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our firm, and uh, uh, I'm just trying to click here. I don't think my oh there we go. Um, so so M and P is uh, 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 one of Canada's uh, largest uh, accounting and professional services firms. Uh, we're the fifth largest in Canada, and we've been around um, since 1958. And um, historically um, established in the prairies of Canada, and uh, I got to know the firm fairly well because I grew up right near Brandon, Manitoba, which is a place that probably not many of you have heard about. Um, so the firm grew over the years uh, quite dramatically um, to become the fifth largest firm. We've got uh, over 5,000 team members and uh, a little, little over 2,000 uh, CPAs on staff, and we cover coast to coast across Canada. The interesting thing is that MNP also recognized uh, multiple years ago the importance of technology, and we were one of the first firms in the world to file an electronic tax return with a government, and it was a pioneering project between MNP and the Canadian government. Um, also, over the years, we established a, a technology consulting firm uh, within the firm, and um, we also got fairly involved. Um, you know, mid days of, of cryptocurrency and, and became involved with a lot of the Canadian startups and a lot of the Canadian mining exchanges and, and other uh, cryptocurrency businesses over the years in various capacities. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah. So now we're going to get into what we did. Um, we wouldn't be an accounting firm if we didn't uh, provide that uh, disclaimer. It's important to know that the work we did does not constitute a legal review. It is not a third party attestation, meaning an audit. And it was a point in time assessment. And obviously, when we do a point in time assessment, a lot of it depends on the resources available to us. And so someone with additional resources or additional uh, time might have different results. So there's your disclaimer out of the way. Okay, and what we set out to do um, was really to go and, and review information and um, look at current um, uh, Bitcoin implementation uh, as well as um, where it started from in the roots and, and go back to the most um, uh, accurate, I guess, representation of the vision of Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, so we really had to go all the way back to the, uh, to the very origins of Bitcoin and look at information that was written uh, by Satoshi Nakamoto, which included things like the original white paper, included the original source code um, and some other versions of the source code, and also look at various forum posts, emails, original source, uh, et cetera. And, and it was very, very interesting uh, digging through uh, many of the conversations that uh, uh, started um, with, with, the, uh, with the vision and then um, work through the implementation and some, some changes and some very, very uh, hotly debated topics over the years. So it was a very interesting um, way to look at this. But what we, what we had to do was from really an eight page content white paper, um, uh, numerous emails and forum posts, et cetera, we had to tease out the details of what the intention was. 
And, and there's a lot in the white paper, um, even though it's, it's not a lengthy uh, document. But when you go back to what's happening uh, with the various versions of the protocols and with, with uh, the various implementations, you can see how various details from the original white paper were either implemented or were changed over time, which affects the, the vision of the, uh, of the, of the Bitcoin uh, uh, ecosystem. So that was really what we set out to do, was to determine the original vision from, from all of this information and then look at um, Bitcoin itself, what's happened to Bitcoin over the years and, and how true to the original vision it stayed. And then we looked at another protocol, which is, which is BSV. You know, accounting firms like to be a little boring. And um, that means that we often just, we tell you what we found up front and then we walk you through how we got there. So effectively, um, the, the, we will go over the journey, um, uh, uh, the framework we used, why the framework is important, and the conclusion we reached. And, in, and, and again, being those boring people, we're going to give you that the conclusion was that the Bitcoin SV um, is moving closer to that original vision, where BTC is moving away, drifting uh, drifting away. And in the next few slides, and with the time that we have, we're going to walk you through the framework we, we, uh, we used and the manner and, and, and the journey. And then, of course, the, the, the actual study is going to be available and uh, be, be made available by MNP. So, so when we look at um, any protocol, um, including Bitcoin, uh, you could look at other protocols such as TCP IP, um, other types of network protocols. Uh, you, when you're analyzing that information, you kind of block or chunk the, the um, uh, various analysis into, into these uh, blocks. So we looked at, <clears throat> for example, uh, starting with the capabilities, what, what can the protocol do? Um, and there's some headings in there such as transaction validation, identity, uh, network access. So, so we looked at each of those elements under the capabilities and that really is what's used to drive the outcomes of, of what the protocol delivers. Then we look at the various components um, that are part of the protocol. So things like the timestamp server, things like uh, the, the consensus mechanism, the proof of work, uh, things like incentives and policies, et cetera, um, the various stakeholders that can be involved and, and the network and blocks. Um, so those elements are really um, technical components. And then we look at the requirements and we looked at functional and non-functional, but the non-functional requirements are listed here. Things like integrity, transparency, uh, transparency, auditability, availability, and scalability. And there were, there were a few others that we looked at as well. And then we look at the attributes of how um, the protocol is implemented in various uh, forms. Things like the block size, things like the economic incentives that are built into the network, consensus, scalability, and then we looked into detail um, at, at the elements within the uh, script language, so, so how the opcodes um, are enabled and various aspects of the scripting um, used. With Brian covering uh, the major components that we looked at, um, I'm going to cover the assessment framework itself. What we did was we took each one of those uh, pieces that Brian covered and we uh, distilled it down to actual testing criteria. And so, for example, well, what do those capabilities actually mean? What are the, the, the what's the sub criteria? And uh, we, we, we actually um, drilled into that level of detail to come, come up with our results. And so, so far, I'll just catch you up. So we covered who we are, we've covered what we did, and the next section is really about what we found. So in terms of, uh some of the key findings there. Um, we, did, we did look at, uh, again, I mentioned that where we got the information. So going through the review of emails, forum posts, et cetera, um, it, it really talks to the original vision, which was really meant to be an improved way of, of sending and receiving uh, value um, through transactions uh, digitally. Um, with less chance of, of losing your personal data while solving the major problems uh, of double spend. And, and really, um, you know, you can look at the digital cash, the peer-to-peer -peer aspects of, of how this system was intended to work. And these were all um, described in the white paper and then drawn out through the various um, 
emails, forum posts, etc. Once the code was released and and people started looking at it and working with it, uh, in addition to Satoshi himself, so a lot of the discussions were around uh, aspects of 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 you know how people could send uh, digital cash from 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 one person to another, how this was going to enable how the um, the privacy uh, of individuals was going to be maintained, and how the uh, the, the the currents or the the cash would be um, prevented from a double spend scenario. Um, so, really, what what Satoshi was um, intending to create was a system that would allow for really flexibility. And you can see when you when you compare um, some of the things that are being done with Bitcoin today, as well as some of the things that are being done with Bitcoin SV, it really is a a a, a system that does a lot more than provide digital cash. It enables many types of, of applications. It enables many types of use cases. And really, it all stems from, from the original vision. So really, um, it's a more efficient means of handling internet payments, um, particularly small casual transactions. And um, you can make that possible by eliminating the need for financial intermediaries, which, which add fees and, and uh, delays and cost. Um, but Bitcoin, even in the original state, was meant to be used for as many different functions as possible, things like uh, on uh, vending machines that had digital cash, uh, emails that were paid, um, uh, SaaS products, uh, website activations, etc. And it was uh, intended to scale with some economic in incentives um, and, and also driven through low transaction fees. So in a nutshell, those are some of the key findings that, that, that we came up with by reviewing this material. So Brian covered basically the intentions piece. What were the intentions? And certainly those intentions um, required a, a, a couple of really key pieces. One of them is that the block size, um, in our opinion, in the, in the opinion that was expressed uh, by Satoshi early on, was meant to allow for a large number of transactions. And so that block size became a critical piece of, uh, of our assessment framework. The other piece is the enablement and, um, and what you could do with a really effective scripting language with the opcodes and uh, the capabilities that they provide. And again, um, in our assessment, uh, BTC has fewer opcodes. Uh, a lot of that functionality of those opcodes has been impaired or removed. And again, um, some of the, the, the uh, very specific opcodes um, are not as useful as they could be. Whereas in the BSV environment, that is in fact the, uh, the opposite. And that really takes us to why, why do these things matter? Uh, why is it important for, uh, for us to look at uh, Satoshi's original um, uh, intentions. So what we what we uh, looked at were were you know how how some of the original elements of the vision were enabled or not. Um, so really, the the primary electronic um, or digital cash payment system was was a vision for a, gro a global network, and and to a large extent, it remains unrealized when you compare it to to other systems. So. So we've really, um, in terms of Bitcoin, um, you know, in, in many places it is being used as a as a transactional, uh, even point of sale uh, a cash system. It's used to um, to transfer large amounts of value uh, across uh, be between parties. It's also used to uh, store value. People are holding on to it and and seeing it increase in value or decrease depending on the on the day. Um, but really, what it's even though we've got a large number of, of people using it. Uh, the number of transactions processed per day really through the network uh, in its entirety it, it pales by comparison to what some of the other systems are capable of doing. Um, you know, billions of transactions a day are enacted on, on the various uh, systems out there. And we see that uh, the Bitcoin systems themselves are, are really a small uh, fraction of that uh, compared to the overall volume. Um, so the, 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 the combined value of the currency um, or, or the uh, the cash and the value stored in it um, is, is very small compared to the uh, the global store of value in, in all the currencies, and the transaction volumes um, 
are very small compared to fiat systems. We also have issues um, related uh, that, that, are, that are sort of contributing to this. One is volatility. So if you're transacting um, you know, a, a, a business transaction and your, and your value of, of, the, uh, of the cash changes uh, by the hour or by the day, uh, how do you handle that? So the volatility is, is incredibly difficult for a lot of people to get their heads around. Um, also, the scalability, when you're looking at Bitcoin itself, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not capable of handling mi millions of transactions per second or, or even hundreds of thousands. It's, uh, it, it's limited. Um, we also looked at uh, ease of use and general acceptability. Um, it's still fairly, uh, it's getting a lot better now, a lot easier uh, because there's a lot more um, people offering wallets and, and uh, onboarding and things like that to make it easy to, to uh, get a, a wallet and acquire uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. And then people are now talking about it because as we've noticed in other trends, the millennials are all over this stuff. Um, there's also an issue with reputation and perception. Uh, a lot of people uh, recall the early days of Bitcoin and, and even current days where it's used to enable uh, proceeds of crime, it's used to enable ransomware payments, etc. So a lot of people are, are skeptical of this as a day-to-day -day, uh, payment system. And then there's other use case elements um, in, in the vision that um, that really haven't been uh, fully enabled by Bitcoin because some of the uh, limitations that we talked about in our report. Um, but it does include, uh, like when we look at the other use case elements, uh, the system itself does include um, elements necessary to enable the distributed data applications. Um, so it was uh, enable or initially envisioned that there would be other data other than just transaction information stored uh, in the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, the scripting language, the script itself was meant to be extensible and flexible. And a lot of this was enabled um, within the with the core of the of the client software. So. Um, so really, those are some of the key findings. We, we have a lot more detail in the report, but um, in a summary format, that's, that's kind of essentially what we found. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Uh, so um, what we've covered so far is what we did, what we found, and really the, the question in your mind is, okay, so what's next? Uh, we'll be looking for a publication date that will happen in the next little while where we'll make a full study available to everyone, including the assessment framework. The study includes a number of uh, 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 annexes that describes precisely the framework we used, the criteria we looked at, how that criteria was assessed, and uh, what led us to the conclusion that the Bitcoin SV protocol is closer to Satoshi's original um, intention. Um, as we had done this assessment, we also came across the need to look at um, the use of energy and the way the various protocols uh, consume resources. And that is potentially another area we'll be look at, looking at in the future. And with that, um, we want to thank CoinGeek Conference for allowing us to present the results of our study and uh, looking forward to one day uh, meeting everyone face to face. Thank you. Data is double-edged. Wield it well and build your place in tomorrow. But trust it blindly and risk watching your progress crumble. Because much of the data we rely upon isn't reliable at all. At Enchain, we believe in data, but we put no faith in it. Instead, we build tools that enable enterprises to trust the data upon which they rely. Enchain, data without question.